We're with Shirley Zane, Sonoma County Supervisor for our third district here. It's really awesome that you're here. Thank thanks, you. It's nice to be time. here. Yeah. yeah. You know, before we start uh, started our segment, we were talking a bit about everything you're doing, uh, which it sort of blows me away because I think I have a schedule. And turns <laughs> out, I, I have a, I have a shred of notions that might occur to me in a day. Yeah. You have so much to do. How do you balance that? Well, I don't always. <laughs> yeah? Is it just, I mean, people, yeah. people who say I have really good people who work for me that help me balance my life. And then I try and make time to have fun, too. And um, these days, my, my passion is spending time with my uh, quarter horse, uh, rescue quarter horse named Lucy. Oh, right so, and I still tr get out and road bike also. So it's either horseback riding or, or road biking. And, uh, and just try and have fun, you know. It, it's a fun job, it's a demanding job, mm -hmm. and it's a stressful job, but um, I try and focus on the 90% that's fun. So. What, what attracted you to it? Why, why this kind of public service? Um, well, you know, I actually had a group of people that were bugging me to run for office. I had been running nonprofits for mm -hmm. 14 years. I ran the hospital chaplain services, and I have a past as... You have a degree in theology, right? I, I yeah, do. I yeah. have two master's degrees. I have one in, in theology and then one in marriage, family, and child counseling. So okay. I was a former family therapist. I'm a former missionary. I'm a former um, uh, special ed teacher mm -hmm. and also a former hospital chaplain. And then I ran nonprofits for 14 years as the chief executive officer. And I kind of... Um, really grew the Council on Aging that, that provides Meals on Wheels and a lot of other senior services. And um, uh, it was a $2 million nonprofit when I walked in. It was a $4 million nonprofit when I left with a big new kitchen and office building and uh, really created some mental health programs there as well mm -hmm. and other things. And a lot of people were noticing that I was good at what I did. And so they said, we want you to run for office. And, um, was it flattering or was it daunting? Um, you know, it was actually kind of a, I was being pulled in that direction. It, it's always been, I've never really had a road map to my life. It's mm -hmm. more like what um, I feel called to. And I've always felt called to public service and especially uh, protecting the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. That's always been my calling. And so it seemed to fit with my calling more than anything. But Oftentimes, people start with the city council and then graduate to supervisor. I, I know. I just took a great big leap. And a matter of fact, I was running for the city council. And I had a whole um, group that I had. And I'd only met with them one morning. We were going to meet every uh, one Monday morning a week to plan my campaign. And it was going to be city council. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that if I ran for city council, it was more, it was a stipend. It wasn't really a full-time paid job right. without staff. and and um, I wouldn't be able to do the health and human services, which I had done my whole life. Right. And I thought, well, I don't need another part-time uh, unpaid job. My job's <laughs> big enough as it, as it is. And so I said um, to my husband and my friend, uh, who was a state senator, or she was assemblywoman at that point, um, Noreen Evans, I said, well, I've never ran for office. I probably sh couldn't be running for county supervisor. And um, they both said, you should and you w should and you will win mm -hmm. and um why the confidence though what did they see besides i mean you have a great resume obviously and you've yeah a lot, but there's something about you there's something a drive something that they re responded to yeah I, I think they just realized i had so much to offer in terms of the county and that um if i could successfully re uh, run a multi-million dollar nonprofit for that many years mm -hmm. i could probably run a campaign as well uh, which is true, you know, if you can run a business, yeah. you can run a campaign, and it's a lot, it is about running a business, really. And so um, they just, they really believed in me. Yeah. So when I went back the next Monday and said, well, I have an announcement to make. I said, I hope you all stay with me. Um, I'm going to run for, I'm going to run for county supervisor instead. So you told this to your, your city council. Seat, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they all kind of, they all, you know, their mouths all dropped open. It's like, oh, we're going to have to raise a lot more money. It turned out to be a $1.1 million campaign. It was the uh, 
highest uh, fundraising campaign ever in the county. It, we've since then, there have been a couple of other records that have been broken, but 1.1 million total. I, that's pretty astounding. It is astounding. I, I am so glad I didn't know what, what was ahead of me. I, I never would have done it. It was 15 months of campaigning, yeah. two campaigns, a primary and then a general. But it seems like that's the trend. That's what it takes these days yeah. to get that kind of awareness. Yeah, no, it is. Oops. And so I, I won. I won by 10 percent. Mm, and um, good, yeah. yeah. Running a campaign, running a business, you said you, if you can do one, you can do the other. Yeah. Uh, anything different, though? Did you learn anything? Uh, maybe well, I think what kept me away from running for office for so many years is that I had ra I'd literally raised millions of dollars for nonprofits. Right. And that was about feeding people and taking care of people and providing critical um, uh, social support and right. spiritual support in hospitals. Taking and the money and then putting it somewhere specifically where it does yeah, good. Yeah, where it was seen, doing good. Yeah. And so to raise money for myself felt very um, self-indulgent and didn't seem to really square with my values. I kept saying, I'm going to wait for campaign reform until right. I run for <laughs> office. But it enables you, though, to do the work that you do best. Yes. So you kind of had to. Yes, I had yeah. to. And yeah. so um, I think where I shifted is that it wasn't about raising money for me. It was about raising money for the campaign. And the campaign represented values. Right. It represented values of taking care of our most vulnerable, of taking having a healthy uh, community, taking care of our infrastructure, taking care of our economy, taking care of people who needed it the most, mm -hmm. um, it, and taking care of our environment, what, too. What is it? I mean, there, there's a theme with the work you've been pursuing throughout your career uh, when it, uh, where, when it comes to helping those who need help to help themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. What is it about, uh, for lack of a better term, the, the the little guy, the underdog, you know, the people in need that that compels you so much? Um, well, you know, I was raised by two very socially conscious people: a public school teacher, my mom, and um, uh, my dad was an aerospace engineer, but he was also a distinguished flying cross mm -hmm. uh, wow. um, marine veteran from World War II who had a very strong social conscious, had debated for African Americans to be on the Georgia Tech um, football team mm -hmm. right after the war. Wow. And okay. um, uh, he also wrote the school newspaper and frequently challenged the issues there in terms of segregation in the South at Georgia Tech. My mom worked in a completely integrated school district in Southern California. And so I, I had good um, genetic makeup mm -hmm. in terms of <laughs> social values. But um, I also had a speech impediment for eight years, which is interesting because I, you know, I really make my living as a, as a speaker. Professional communicator. Yeah, sure, yeah. A professional communicator. And I literally had a speech therapist for eight years. Nobody could understand what I was saying until I was five years old. Wow. So I got teased a lot. Plus I had red hair. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt, I knew what it felt like to be, um, to be bullied. I, I, I did. I, I was on the receiving end a lot of that. Let, let's come back to that in a second here. We're with uh, Sonoma County Supervisor Shirley Zane, and uh, we're going to pick up in a second uh, a very interesting theme we're on. Yeah. Get your ass out of here. You're not in here. Yes, I am. Every day, kids witness bullying. Why are you stabbing me with it? No, no. They want to help, no. but don't know how. Oh, you Teach your kids how to be more than a bystander. Visit stopbullying.gov. We're with Sonoma County Supervisor Shirley Zane, and uh, we were talking previously and a little bit during our break um, mm. about the sort of origin of personal empathy. And you had mentioned uh, having grown up a redhead and with a speech impediment, mm -hmm. and that sort of sensitized you, I think, um, to the effects of bullying, uh, for, among other issues, I'm sure. Yeah. What, let's talk about that process. Um, uh, if you don't mind going into the speech no. impediment, what, how did it manifest? Um, I had um, chronic ear infections, so um, I literally had, I think, six ruptured eardrums but before I was five. My mother used to take me into the um, emergency room a lot yeah. uh, when I was young, and so I couldn't hear the sounds. So I had an articulation disorder, what you call, and I, I have a speech, a degree in speech pathology, I should say, <laughs> <laughs> from Chico State. I was interested first in my career of being a speech therapist. And um, so I really couldn't hear the sounds. So um, 
I talked a lot like Elmer Fudd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My middle name is Ruth, and I used to tell everybody it was Anne because I didn't want to say Ruth. Yeah. So, um, so that's really where it came from, but it took a long time um, to, to change that. And in, yeah. were you teased in school? Or? I got, oh, all the time. Yeah. Um, I was, and I got a double whammy, both because I had the speech impediment yeah. and because I had red hair. And you know, bullying of redheads is now a well-acknowledged phenomena. Yeah. Matter of fact, there's going to be a, uh, a ginger pride in San right, Francisco right. next year. It's like, I'm there. <laughs> Are you kidding? I know exactly what that feels like. You, you get called everything when you have red hair, really. And because we're only... In, in Scotland, I think it's something like one out of 40 or something. It's very high, and I have Scottish mm -hmm. um, ancestors. My, I'm, my mom's name was Morton. Mm -hmm. um, but in um, America, it's only one out of 100. So we're very... <laughs> kind of rare. Pretty, pretty yeah. rare, yeah. Pretty rare, yeah. And so w what do you do with that empathy? What do you do with that kind of energy? Uh, it sounds like, in, in your case, you made a career out of taking that, sens that sensitivity yeah. and in recognizing the needs of others. How much can you take in, though, before it becomes overwhelming? Well, I, I think the different, there are, what I always would teach people, and I used to train hospital chaplains, and I used to train either even doctors and nurses in how to provide psychosocial support mm -hmm. and um, these types of, of counseling skills. And there's a difference between empathy and sympathy. Okay. Sympathy is really where you drop your boundaries, and it's more about pity. Um, and empathy is really about retaining your boundaries and, and saying you, you empathize with whatever that person is feeling, but you still know where they um, end and you begin. See, I would, I would, so you don't become enmeshed in it. Yeah, I'd be yeah. afraid of projecting myself into their situation so much so that I just felt as terrible as they did. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and that, that's sympathy, really. Yeah. And what I think most people do in our culture is really just separate themselves from the pain, mm -hmm. you know, and they do it in all kinds of different ways. But um, most of us just don't want to get that close to somebody else's pain. It makes us very anxious. So, you know, we blame people a lot for their pain. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and we often blame the mentally ill for being mentally ill. And we do. And um, that is something, as you know, I've been working very diligently right. on my whole life, uh, both as a family therapist and somebody who created mental health programs when I was at the Council on Aging and also um, one of my proudest accomplishments as a county supervisor is that I uh, founded the mobile st uh, support team, mm -hmm. which is the, a group of, th uh, it's basically a team of therapists and substance abuse counselors and family outreach workers that go out to the 911 calls um, regarding mental health crises. Right. So it's a huge tool for the law enforcement. They love it. We were able to get $3 million um, in the last two years to expand it. So now it goes all the way down to Petaluma and um, up to Windsor and Roner Park and Santa Rosa. So. Have, have you seen how we treat the mentally ill locally? Has it changed over the years? It, it, it seems like it, there's more attention now. Yeah, there's a lot more attention. Uh, for one thing, um, we are dealing with it, I think, as a community in in some very tragic ways. Mm -hmm. um, healthcare, because it has largely been a for-profit healthcare system, with the exception of Medicare here in the United States, um, has, has always stigmatized uh, mental health, and it has not properly treated. And yet, in 2008, we passed a federal law uh, called the Mental Health Parity Act. Right. And um, what that essentially means is that you have to provide equal treatment for mental health services as you would for any other illness. Yeah, it seems but like it's mental not health, happening. It's, <laughs> mental health has been segregated from one's overall health yes. when, when in fact it's integral. It, it should be integrated. Yeah. Good health care completely and utterly integrates. And, and some, some uh, systems are acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. um, I think our clinics and our county behavioral health services, we spend over $50 million on behavioral health at the county, all kinds of different services, including inpatient and for youth and children and families and um, older adults. Um, I think we spend a lot more, actually, what people need to know if people hate to pay taxes, but um, the county mental health system is by far the best in, here in Sonoma County, uh, superior to any of the private wow. um, caregivers, I feel. Yeah, yeah well, what is, what is it about our particular uh, situation with mental health in Sonoma County, what, what are the afflictions that we're seeing mostly mm -hmm. out there? 
Um, you know, a lot of things. I think sometimes we see early onset of schizophrenia um, in, in young teens, right. and, and that needs to be diagnosed a lot earlier. But we see a lot of um, severe depression in older adults. Mm -hmm. um, we also see um, a lot of anxiety. Anxiety and depression really go hand in hand, and my husband certainly suffered from more from anxiety than he did from depression. Um, but, but often part of the same coin. They, yeah. they are. Yeah. We, we call them in therapy circles the cousins mm -hmm. because they're almost always connected. And, you know, if somebody has never had an anxiety attack, if they can just imagine what their body feels like when they're about ready to go down uh, the hill on the roller coaster. Mm -hmm or something scary is about to happen to them. Yeah, there are physical symptoms. Oh yeah, yeah, it's hugely, it's very painful. And then if you can imagine that feeling and then just having it grip you and stay with you. And having it constantly. And constantly, yeah. And and never knowing when it's gonna hit. Yeah, yeah. it's- um, It becomes so paralyzing, a, you. Yeah, it's, it's, it is paralyzing, it yeah. is. And um, with depression and with people who, who take their lives and, I do not believe in most cases uh, when somebody is severely depressed, it is a choice. Mm -hmm. I believe they die of depression because they lose that innate ability to survive. You know, we have that innate ability as human beings to right. survive, but the, the midbrain has that flight or fight mechanism. And right. when that fight leaves you, then there's nothing there but the flight. There's right. no more fight to, to survive. And I remember uh, Peter saying to me uh, two days before he took his life, and I was uh, desperately trying to get him the services he needed from Kaiser, which did not provide him services. Mm. Um, and I didn't find out um, how much they had failed until four months later when I interviewed the doctor and the therapist. But he said to me two days before he took his life, I, ha I have no fight left in me. It's mm -hmm. like it's gone. And, um, and people who are um, over 40 and they get into that place, it's almost like they do need, um, and it's very successful, mild um, electric um, uh, shock therapy. Mm -hmm. And it sounds awful, it's nothing like... Um, what it used to be, of course. Yeah, yeah, like what it used to be, but it actually works because drugs don't often um, reach that middle brain. Mm -hmm. um, but, but they do need intense treatment because they will die without it. Depression yeah. is terminal when it, untreated. It, it yeah. becomes terminal, absolutely, yeah. Let's return to this after mm -hmm. a break. We're with uh, Sonoma County Supervisor Shirley Zane from our third district here locally, uh, and uh, we'll be right back. From this angle, it all makes a star. I'm a teacher. Let me tell you what I make. I make learning a privilege, not a chore. show up. And frustration, a tool, not an obstacle. I make working hard seem easy. And giving up, impossible. And then we're going to turn the lights and everybody look up. I make an old subject feel like a fresh thought. What's your reaction? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And unconventional methods, uh, okay, what else? common. I said, this is their world. There's nothing. I'm going to die. Go ahead, go, go, go. I'm a teacher. I make. We're with Sonoma County Supervisor Shirley Zane, uh, having a, a pretty interesting, I mean, obviously very interesting conversation, but we, we were just talking about the nature of depression and how often it, it can unfortunately end up as a, as a terminal situation because if untreated or, un, or not treated correctly. Sufficiently, yeah. yeah sufficiently, uh, it, it, uh, it, it removes what we're, you refer to as the uh, survival mechanism, the sort of the will, you know, to, uh, well, the fight as you said in your husband's exactly. case. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this seems to be happening uh, a little too often in, uh, especially uh, ironically for those who have insurance or who are covered, you know, by various healthcare programs. And uh, there was a case recently we were discussing uh, about a woman who was with a healthcare provider who didn't, did not receive the treatment she needed. And after two months of dealing with that, uh, ended up taking her own life. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I do want to talk about that a little bit because it was a huge story. It remains a huge story. Um, I think the LA Times and the Chronicle 
are thinking about, um, I mean, they've actually talked to me. What were the uh, circumstances? Well, here's what happened. It was a Kaiser patient, like my, my husband was, and I have been very vocal about Kaiser not providing sufficient uh, ratios for therapists mm -hmm. or timely access. The state has too. They find them. They fa uh, fi find them four million dollars, and Kaiser paid it. Right. Um, and then they went back and said Kaiser has uh, corrected four out, uh, two out of the four inefficiencies. They're still they're still not doing everything they need to do. Clearly, they they weren't. They have claimed that they have been able to provide timely access. But this was an 83 year old woman who was told um, after she went to the ER that she couldn't then and then saw somebody that she couldn't see somebody for another two months, a psychiatrist. They put her back on Prozac when the Prozac had not worked. So they re-prescribed um, uh, a drug that clearly had been ineffective with her and then made her wait, and then said, we're, we're gonna make you wait for another two months. Which is harrowing, I mean, that's an it, eternity. It's horrible, she distress. was in so much right. pain. And so she um, and her husband was also desperately trying to hang on to her and so she woke up and she couldn't, handle the pain and she put on her house coat. She drove down to Kaiser's parking garage and she jumped off the, um, uh, the third level and killed herself. And they are on the property. Yeah, and she had had her Kaiser card. She in. had her Kaiser card right. in her uh, pocket. The family contacted me because they read about um, my story with Peter um, and that I had been a very strong um, uh, critic of Kaiser's failure to provide mental health parity and timely access and so um, they also contacted the Press Democrat and they did this story. Um, <clears throat> but what they haven't talked about yet is that the mediators um, who are paid outsized med mediators, uh, they don't work directly for Kaiser, right. started contacting the family almost immediately trying to get them to settle and to be quiet. Um, which is, to me, just outrageous. It's just outrageous. You know, Kaiser needs to step up and say, we haven't fixed the system. Uh, we need to do better, and uh, mental health parity is the law. Um, the government has not tried uh, any health care system for not reaching mental health parity. Right. So the government is um, lax, too, um, which is basically the Center for Medicaid and, and Medicare Services. They but you are the government now. I am the government. <laughs> so. You better believe it. I took an oath of office. I, that's that's right. And so um, I have been a very um, loud. I always feel like a little bit like David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. uh, Kaiser is a giant, and I feel like little David. But I got a good slingshot here, um, and I've hit him once, and I've hit him twice. And um, I think we all need to keep hitting him when we realize that this is about saving people's lives, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, they have a for-profit system in terms of their doctors right. and they make a lot of money. They make $10.7 million a week. They shouldn't make it on the backs of people who are mentally ill. We should be, if somebody walks into an ER and is severely depressed, they should get the same level of treatment as if they walked into that ER and was, was having some type of um, uh, heart palpitation sure, had a, or had something. A, an obvious wound, I think that's the problem. Or an obvious wound, yeah. It's not obvious, it's yeah. unseen. So that's why often it's not treated. Um, do, you, do you think that you would have more influence if you kept moving up the ladder in terms of office? Do you, I mean, is that something? Yeah, a lot of people have encouraged me to run uh, for State higher Senate office. Or yeah, or, yeah, I've been encouraged, but, but they've also said, however, because Congress and even Sacramento isn't very effective these days, and mm -hmm in doing legislation because of the partisan divides um, that I can be very, very effective at the county level. Yeah. And matter of fact, I introduced a resolution to the National Association for Counties because I serve on the health care um, committee and we basically write uh, the platform for the counties for the federal government. Right. Um, and the resolution was that the federal government should pay for the mobile support teams. One of the reasons why we're having so many crises, I think, with our law enforcement and people who are mentally ill is because we're not giving them the tools they need. Right. Um, and so uh, my colleagues absolutely loved that resolution. They adopted it like that. It is a major topic today that counties are not properly funded to treat mental health uh, illnesses in our county jails. And right. that's where a lot of the treatment happens. 
And uh, in terms of recidivism or yep. uh, just, you know, getting people healthy back into the community, not coming back into jail, not hurting other people, not hurting themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all of the taxpayer dollars it costs when we treat people who either have a substance abuse or are mentally ill um, through the criminal justice system. It's really a waste of taxpayer dollars. So, but some of it is, is this, is the government has to get tough on mental health parity with these for-profit health care providers that are making millions of dollars. Bernard Tyson is the CEO of Kaiser. He had a meeting scheduled with me and mm -hmm. he canceled it. Mm -hmm. And then he said he was going to reschedule it and then he never did. He put me off. So um, he's in Oakland and I requested a meeting with him because I wanted to talk to him about ways that they could improve their system and tell him the story of my husband. And obviously, um, he was advised by his lawyers that uh, he should cancel the meeting and not meet with me. Um, he makes um, just salary alone over four million dollars a year. Mm. Wow. How do you balance your life with everything that you're dealing with, not just with your job as supervisor, but with all these other points of passion? Because I could see how this could, I mean, this is very demanding, obviously, yeah. and, and, and touches many aspects of, of, of your experience. How do you do this and, and keep a life and not be absorbed by your work? Um, Which seems so total. Yeah, it, well, it is a 24-7 job. It really is. But you do have to step away and, and enjoy your life. And so, you know, I do that by, a, I adopted a rescue horse mm -hmm. and, I, and I spend time riding her. And uh, I'm, I've gotten back into my 10-year-old cowgirl self where <laughs> uh, my, my assistant laughs because she says, I, I'm hearing you ching. You're, yeah, but put my spurs <laughs> right, on right. and my boots. And you, yeah, I love that chinging sound around the eyes. I said, I'm going to go see Lucy. You know, it's the end of the day. So it's, you know, you try and have uh, as much fun and as many friends as possible and take good care of yourself physically and mentally and emotionally. And sometimes it gets to me too, like anybody else. Yeah. You know, it's, I, sometimes I feel like I carry a heavy weight on my shoulders in terms of caring for our most vulnerable people and really being a voice for them as well. Yeah. No, they're lucky to have you. Yeah, thank you. Shirley Zane, Sonoma County Supervisor for our third district right here. Thank you for being on, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we'll have thanks. you back. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah.